Welcome to the Widowed Mom Podcast, episode 219, Widows Unfiltered, an interview with Erica Lee. Welcome to the Widowed Mom Podcast, the only podcast that offers a proven process to help you work through your grief, to grow, evolve, and create a future you can truly look forward to. Here's your host, Master Certified Life Coach, Grief Expert, Widow, and Mom, Krista St. Germain. Hey there, welcome to another episode of the podcast. Hey, I have a request for you. If this podcast has improved your life, if you're in any way better because you've listened to this podcast, would you please do me a favor and leave a rating or even better, a review wherever you listen to the podcast. And the reason is that one, it helps me learn what you like about the podcast, but even more than that, it tells the podcast apps that this podcast is good and that other people should listen to it. It gets us in front of other widows and there are 11 million of us in the US. And you know, if you've listened to me for any length of time, I want to reach all of them, (laughs) at least 1 million. Can we at least get to one? So your rating and review, just it helps do that. It helps more widows find the podcast and it really literally changes lives. So if you would take even five minutes to do that, I would be so, so grateful. And other widows who have yet to discover the podcast would also be so, so grateful. Okay. Today, you're going to get to learn and enjoy getting to know my former client, Erica. I love Erica's energy. You will love it too. I love her story. I love, it's always fun to have examples of women who have done the Mom Goes On program that don't live in the same time zone as the United States um, and being in Australia very much not in our time zone, but she still made it work for her. And she just has a lot of wisdom to share. And I think you will enjoy her story, appreciate her story, come away from her story feeling uplifted and heard and encouraged. That's my hope. So with that, let's jump in to my interview with Erica Lee. Okay, Erica Lee, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. It for people who don't know, I'll let you introduce yourself, but we really didn't get to see a lot of each other on camera because of the time zone difference. So it is kind of fun to see actually like be face to face time with each other because you live in a completely different time zone. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Though to me, it feels so natural because I've seen you so much. It uh-huh. feels like yeah. no change to me. <laughs> People are asking me all the time, like, "Can I do this if I don't live in the re- in the same time zone, or can I do this if I live in a country that's you know way far away?" And you're such a good example of that. But we'll get into all that. So, yes, yes. let's start. Just introduce yourself. Tell the audience a little bit about who you are, how you became a widow. Give us the basics. Hmm. Well, hello to the audience. Hello, everybody. I'm Erica. I live in Brisbane, Australia. I have three sons in their 20s. Um, I met my husband when I was 21 and he was 26. And he died two and a half years ago when I was 59. And he had a he was diagnosed in 2019 with uh, glioblastoma, which is a terminal cancer, brain cancer, and he lived for 16 months. And so he died in November 2020, so about two and a half years ago. Yeah. It's it's funny how I never heard of glioblastoma until I became a life coach. And then I just feel like there's so much of it. Yes. That was a cancer you were familiar with before, but every time I hear... Uh, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had heard of it, but I thought, oh, that's like getting struck by lightning. You know, that's yeah. really unlucky. Poor people, <laughs> you yeah. know, and then, because then, it yeah, just it just sense. comes out of the blue, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that happened in November of 2020. How did you then find me or the, did you find the podcast first? What happened? We- I sure. So, um Look, like most widows, I felt totally um, unprepared for Mm -hmm. being a widow, even though I'd had the 16 months or so um, leading up to it. And, you know, I didn't know any widows. 
Mm -hmm. like, like so many people, I didn't know anybody. And so I started looking around at books because I'm a, a big reader and I couldn't find any books that were of real interest. I read a few and didn't like them that much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had, I did have this basic story going around in my head that I'm sure many widows have, which is, um, you know, it's all over for me. Mm. My life is just sad, sad, sad. I've, I've mm -hmm. had the big tragedy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there was no template at all for me to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I did, I, you know, there's a, there was a bit of rebellion in me against that. <laughs> and somewhere, I reckon, probably in the first few months, I'm guessing a little bit, Krista, I found your podcast. Mm -hmm. I found a few other podcasts too, but yours I listened to really religiously, mm. you know, week to week. And I listened to it for an entire year, I think. <clears throat> and um, it, it really did give me hope. It gave me hope that and it also gave me lots of practical common sense. Well, maybe not so, so common sense, but practical advice about how to be getting on with things. And it also gave me a lot of hope that that uh, fuzzy template that I had in my head, not that anybody stated it, nobody was saying anything about what it was like to be a widow. Nobody could help me. Mm -hmm. um, so nobody was saying, oh, your life's just sad from now on. But um, you were obviously challenging that. And, you know, um, also I have to say uh, you have a very beautiful, melodious voice and listening to you <laughs> once a week, you know, while I was going through stuff was comforting on a lot of levels. And you've probably heard that from other other I, have, I, I find it yeah. odd because I don't think of myself that way. And I certainly never thought that would be part of podcasting, but it is consistent feedback that I get. And that yes. people sleep, like fall asleep listening to the podcast. I get that a lot too. Yes. Like purposefully they go. put it on and then, yeah, it's comforting <laughs> as they go to sleep. Yeah. 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 So I listened to you for a year at least. And, um, Meanwhile, I'd done some other things like I had dived into some study, study that I really loved and was really engaging. So a few months after Chester died, I um, dived into some online courses in um, they, ha they happened to be in, in mindfulness coaching mm -hmm. and th that went for over a year and it was incredibly engaging and it felt like a growth path and it felt um, so like it was something dragging me forward. Mm -hmm. but also something I could manage at mm. the time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was coming to the end of that and I was thinking that was a kind of a year and a half after Chester died and I was kind of thinking, oh, I've got to make some really big widow-type decisions soon. Mm. <laughs> so the big one really big widow-type decision was what do I do with this house? that Chester had chosen and loved and that we had raised our boys in for 11 years and we'd planted this amazing, beautiful native garden that was just growing up everywhere and producing amazing insects and bugs and plant and blossoms and bees and butterflies and lizards. So, you know, there was that. And, um, but I also knew on some level that I couldn't manage this large house and that as my boys were, my boys had come back to stay with us when Chester was sick, they stayed for the year and helped out, but they were going off to their lives again. And I was getting left in this large family house mm -hmm. and that had a lot of wonderful things about it, but really it, the shoe didn't fit anymore. Mm. And I thought, well, that's such a widow problem. I know so many widows must face this exact problem um, and I have to work out what to do. So there was that one. And there was also, um, I hadn't really thought about my single status. Um, well, I hadn't thought about doing anything about it. I was just giving myself space, mm -hmm. but that was another issue that was in my head. And I was thinking, well, what, what do, what do other people think, you know, in this situation? Mm -hmm. What do they do? Um, so those two things really um, made me think, 
you know, it's time to jump into Mum Goes On and get mm. some support to make some big decisions. Yeah, it's always interesting to me to find out what what people's motivations are because it's, you would think it's always the same, but there, there's so many different motivations that people have and problems that they want to solve. Yeah. So let's back up just a little bit too, because I, I think there's so much value in other people hearing what your experience was like in early grief. Um, so can yeah. you talk a little bit about what that was like for you, even, you know, knowing that he was sick for so long, you know, of course that can create some sure. challenges there, of course, but like, what was it like in early grief? Uh, well, in the year that Chester was sick, um, it was very fortunate that he was able to have the tumour removed. Not that that's a cure, but it was mm. removed very early in the process. And most of the time that remained to him, he was totally able to do stuff. And, and he just, we had the most amazing 16 months. Mm. And he, he spent his time um, really making sure that uh, we were going to be all right and and making sure that his legacy which was um not only his wonderful boys but also in the business that he'd founded and built up that that would survive so he and and he also just traveled to parts of our state queensland well we all did to mm -hmm. wild wild places that he loved so like even though it was an incredibly stressful and sad year it was also a really amazing year Mm -hmm. And then he had a very short illness and we were all, well, he had a long illness, but a very short, sudden demise. And okay. we were all, we all stayed with him for a few days in hospital mm -hmm. while he died. Mm -hmm. um, so um, early grief. Um, I remember fe even though there was this lead up and, and it was in ways um, I felt an immense amount of relief because we'd got Chester through to a good death and he, he himself had been a major contributor to getting himself through to a good death. But, he, you know, like the last part was fast. And so I had, first of all, I had this amazing relief, which I wanted to share because I'm sure other people must feel it too. <laughs> And anyway, so, but did you also, have guilt about that relief? Well, I think people looked at me a bit strangely, mm. but, but it didn't last that long. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yeah. I, I actually am really glad you said that because I think very often, well, I, I don't want to be too general and assume, but just after so many conversations that I've had, it seems like most people who have have watched a loved one go through a terminal illness do feel relief, but often don't want to acknowledge that they feel relief because they feel guilty about feeling relieved. Yes. And like like yes. it's something that they did wrong. And so yes. they may not say that they felt it, but they, they did. And they're often judging themselves for it, which of yes. course, is so often. Yes. Yes. Makes total sense. Well, funnily would. enough, yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually not that I haven't found being a widow difficult, but I didn't judge myself about that because I was more literally happy that we'd mm. pulled, and luck was on our side too, you know, that somehow we'd pulled off a final 16 months that wasn't nearly as bad as it might have been, you mm -hmm. know. So um, anyway, so there was that. And then, so it was also and relief the, that that it with the idea that it could have been so much worse and it wasn't. Yes, and you, you it was yes. relief that the quality was where you wanted it to be. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Um and uh and you know, he did die with us all around him. And yeah. you know, like so but then after the relief, I remember feeling like I'd been hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. That it was like um, it, I, I, so that was another thing I thought widows might want to hear, and that is that grief feels very physical, mm. like literally, literally like being hit by a bus. <laughs> and the other thing um, I think is that it's almost a cliche, but after the funeral, people do move on. Everybody moves on. That's how it feels. Mm -hmm. Everybody moves on. And I kind of get that. I know that people 
they're the stars of their own show and they've got their own dramas and sufferings and big things happening in their lives and mostly they don't get they don't get big bereavements like that and i'm not saying i would be any better you know but people don't uh so um i did find that very quickly and the the other thing i found was that people say the wrong thing um frequently um (gasps) or even worse they say nothing 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 (laughs) what were some of the wrong things that were said to you well sometimes it was it was like um it's almost like they just they just completely go off off onto another topic straight away Mm. so that that was probably in a way it was um complete avoidance Mm -hmm. so i got i got that a lot or um they'd ask you how you are and you know i was fortunately um quite self-contained so i wasn't about to blurt out a big sob story but Mm. they would make an excuse or before i'd had a chance to say anything and move away and so that was that kind of thing but actually in a and um i think i mentioned on slack the one about um more or less straight after he died well when when are you downsizing when are you getting out of this house (laughs) and at that stage in my early days of grief grief taking me out of that house would have felt like ripping my skin off it felt you know it just felt like that and then a year and a half later i was really ready to contemplate it but in Mm -hmm. those early days like the house that he was in and filled up the spaces and mm-hmm. chose and do you know um so that was one um yeah but lots of just really like even things like uh they ask you how you are and you say you're well like this this happened recently and i said oh mm-hmm. i'm really well and and that person said oh you look pale and I can't explain how undermining that was. <laughs> Thank you. I don't yes. know. <laughs> like you, you poor thing, you're a widow. What's wrong with, you know, like. Uh-huh. <laughs> so just, um, but I would say the main thing was that people did not talk. And I, I don't know, that's probably not the same in every culture, but um, an example was the first Father's Day um after chester died i was at a celebration for my father for father's day mm-hmm. and i had two of my um 20 something sons with me and we went through the whole celebration lunch with nobody mentioning chester and that it was my first father's day without him and the boys first father's day without him and once again like they're all good people no blame but mm-hmm. boy, I, I, if I, I've learned that if Chester is going to be mentioned, I mention him mm-hmm. and I have to mention him. And if there's going to be a toast raised or whatever, if it's like my birthday's coming up and it's around Chester's birthday, well, I will raise a toast to Chester mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because nobody else is going to do it. So why do you think that is for you? I and mean, I have opinions about what i think and maybe but maybe there's some cultural differences or some ways that you see it differently look i i think it's cultural i i think people um because i'm sure it's not people trying to be nasty do you know and Mm -hmm. i think they are like i think sometimes they think well maybe that will just be painful but I actually think it's just somehow written into the culture. You just mm-hmm. don't talk about these things when, you know, you just move on and, you know, you just keep it, keep it to yourself. And Do you think that same rule applies like inside the, the immediate family? Is that only an, like an external rule outside of your immediate family? I know. I think it's in my immediate family. Okay. It's the whole, yeah. Yeah. So, so people like my parents and I've got lots of brothers and sisters, Mm -hmm. six in fact, (laughs) Mm -hmm. and even my beautiful young men who I'm so proud of, they're such wonderful human beings. Mm -hmm. They rarely talk about him. 
Mm. So I raise him with them all the time and Mm -hmm. not in a creepy or yucky way or an overly Mm -hmm. dwelling way or anything, but just to keep his um, presence around. Mm -hmm. And with, with my boys, I don't know whether it's because they're male. Um, you know, we, we were a bit of an unconventional family, so I'm a little bit surprised by the strength of that cultural message, mm-hmm. really quite surprised. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is pretty consistent, though. I mean, I don't, I, I don't hear a lot of uh, people telling me that those around them have been very comfortable bringing it up or have, you know, been the ones to bring it up even. It usually is something that people are worried about stepping on eggshells around, you know, thinking, oh, she must have forgotten it by now, or if maybe she looks like she's doing fine, so I better not bring it up or that will remind her. Yes. Um, when usually yes. it would be like so refreshing if somebody would just tell a Chester story and Yes. Yes. Yeah. Or just at least acknowledge him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So then you mentioned you loved reading and you started you started reading some books on grief. Were you able to read pretty quickly? Was your widow fog very intense? Not so much? Um, look, I didn't really ex- ex- um, experience it as fog, but I, mm-hmm. I wonder if this, but that feeling of being hit by a bus was kind of whole body. Okay. So it's probably very related. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it kind of <clears throat> was a bit more like, you know, sometimes I just have to leave a situation or, you know, mm-hmm. a social situation or something. I just have to go and sit by myself. And that was, yeah. But I, I'd say, um, you know, I did keep working. My job's not that demanding, but I did keep working and, mm-hmm. you know. Um, the whole so, time? You never took any time off? Oh, no, I took, I did take oh. time off. Yeah, okay. around. I uh, took a few a few weeks around when Chester died. Got it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and I work part time, and it's in the business that he set up. So mm-hmm. yeah, not it's not a high pressure situation. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you could go back and give yourself some wisdom, some advice in the early days, what do you think you would tell yourself? I would say. Give yourself, uh, expect to be feel like you're hit by a bus and give yourself space to rest and cry. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I would say don't expect too much of people. Don't expect the wrong things of people. Don't expect what they can't give. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a hard lesson. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, I had a couple of people who really did turn up you know, I had an old friend who um, we were really close before and we kept sharing in the same way. Not even, it wasn't always about me and my sorrows or whatever, mm-hmm. but, you know, um, she she kept, she just kept coming over reliably and she made a bit of a fuss of me and we talked all about her stuff and then we talked a bit about my stuff. But the thing was she just kept coming and coming mm-hmm. and coming and she did make a little bit of a fuss just you know, I turned 60 after Chester died and, and mm. a few months after, six months after he died and she made sure that there was a big birthday celebration, that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. if there's anybody in your life like that, <laughs> appreciate them. Um, what else? I, I would also say um, you're talking the very early days, hey. Um, I got a lot of um, help from nature which mm-hmm. also sounds cliche, but I don't mean going off on big treks to national parks or anything. I mean walking around our bushy neighbourhood and mm-hmm. and looking in our backyard, which was planted with natives. Mm-hmm. And um, one of my sons, uh, my middle son, who's he's 27 now, I think, he, um, all my sons were really supportive, but he was really somehow able to, come with me on the emotional journey a bit and mm. and we walked we would go around the neighborhood and we would spot insects <laughs> so we went bug spotting and that was kind of we did that a lot I love it. <laughs> and the funny thing was um 
there, there were so many amazing insects. We saw such amazing beauty by really, really looking, mm -hmm. looking really hard, getting our insect eyes on because you don't normally, you just don't see them. Mm -hmm. So that, um, and well, I was curious do... before we go, I'm just curious to know. Yeah. So, so one of the dimensions of post-traumatic post-traumatic growth is appreciation for life. And I know, I know for me, I, I definitely experienced that where there were some moments that even though I was so very sad, where I kind of almost experienced like a childlike wonder, um, was that part of your, your kind of bug experience or, or did you just like go out on a mission? Like, Oh no, definitely. We, and we were genuinely awestruck because when you start to look at insects, at least in our neighborhood, which is oh. kind of bushy, they are simply astounding. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I wonder if I would yeah. find them terrifying and you find them astounding, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we love spiders and uh -huh. all of those things, all the yeah. little creatures, whatever little creatures we could see. Uh -huh. So I also did a bit of artwork just for myself. And mm. I did that while Chester was um, sick. And I did it around the time of his death too. And I've got a little book of it. And that was actually really helpful. And it was helpful because it kind of, um, kind of crystallized a few things for me that I wanted to remember and so on. Mm. So that was um, just, uh, well, my mother had given me a handmade book and I started, I was filling this book up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it had proper art paper in it. And uh, so I just used some, whatever I had to hand, but mainly um, acrylics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that something you had done before Chester's sickness? Or um, a, a, little t a little bit. I'd started, mm -hmm. but not really got anywhere. And then mm -hmm. suddenly I had all this stuff to express. So yeah. Um, during his illness and so on, I, a lot of stuff came out, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. As Linda McCabe would say, it's not about the art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah. She runs her expressive arts group. It's not about yes. the art. It's about what, yes. what needs to come through the art. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so, what for, for people grieving early, mm -hmm. um, uh, I probably, I think I've probably hit the high points there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So at what point did you kind of start feeling like you were ready for more support? I mean, you listened to the podcast for a long time. Did you get to a place, obviously you kind of wanted to make some decisions and had a couple of issues crop up, but were you feeling kind of stagnant? Were you feeling pretty good? What, what were you, how were you feeling? Well, I was probably feeling at a crossroads because I had finished this over a year's worth of study. Uh -huh. which had been this really big tug along and it but it also uh, and also felt like it had given me some recovery space you know like um the things like things like the thought of um selling the house had been so very heart-wrenching and i'd got to a place where i'm thinking well maybe i do need to like it had kind of lost that extremely heart-wrenching quality by that stage um, so, so I'd come to the end of this course and felt, um, I had not exact, I'd kind of been putting off decisions or leaving things until a later date, you know, um, and I thought the time had come for me to kind of face my widowhood a bit more squarely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a very difficult decision for you to make? Uh, it was a big decision. Every, every yeah. time you take something on and also spend money, it's a big decision, right? So, um, and also, of course, there's the time zone issue. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it was a big decision. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, though, you were pretty decided on, it's time for me to address this. Like, was yes. that part difficult? Addressing it is difficult still. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, was that difficult? Um, no, 
no, no, I don't. I don't think so. I just think the time was kind of felt right in that regard. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I had been looking around at what was available to help me. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'd had plenty of time to kind mm -hmm. of come to the decision. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Because it's easy to kick that can, right? It, it's, yes. it's easy yes. to think, oh, I don't want to open this can of worms because, you know, who knows what's in there and it's not going to feel good. But yeah. Well, I suppose I was pushed a bit by, you know, with the the big house emptying out as my sons left, mm. like the house actually started to feel bad because it felt a bit scary um, mm -hmm. to be in this huge house in yeah. a bushy situation with mm -hmm. no one else. And so mm -hmm. I'd find myself at night kind of closing up really carefully and mm -hmm. and and putting myself just in one part of the house where there was curtains and. <laughs> Oh I'm a little bit paranoid, but yeah. You know. Well, hey, you know, I've never lived in a bushy area, so I might be a little paranoid myself. Yeah. <laughs> Security system going. So, yeah. so you decided to join Mom Goes On, and then I always love to know, like, what what did you expect it to be like, and what was it actually like in your eyes? What did I expect it to be like? I had by that stage I had quite a bit of experience doing online courses from mm -hmm. America because mm -hmm. <laughs> the over a year long course I'd done was from America and so um you know um what did I expect I, oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> yeah, we're going back a ways. That was like a year ago, April. I yeah. yeah, I think I was, I think I was kind of already in the mode of doing online things. So mm -hmm. I wasn't too put off by um, the mm -hmm. format or anything. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think I just slipped in quite naturally. Uh huh. Okay. Well, and if you've been listening to the podcast for a year, I mean, that's not exactly new to me. So I assume the things you were learning in Mom Goes On were extensions of what you had already learned on the podcast. There wasn't anything over overly different. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, people don't know what to expect with group coaching or coaching, or, you know, they think it's going to be sad all the time, or, you know, oh, they, yeah, they don't yeah. really know. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, I did. I loved the way um, all kinds of issues were brought to the table, you know, and um, and uh, one of the huge things in Mum Goes On for me was normalisation <laughs> because mm. there's always a widow out there feeling the same thing and in Mum Goes On they're not only feeling it, they're telling you they're feeling it. So, uh -huh. um, How did yeah. you use that to help yourself? Oh, look, I, w I would say that that normalization was absolutely huge because not only, you know, in my, as I mentioned, in my own sphere, I didn't know any widows. And even if I did, that probably, if I'd known one or something, that I'm sure it actually wouldn't have been much of a help, but I, I didn't know anyone. And suddenly I'm surrounded by, I don't know, <laughs> tens yeah. of, of mm -hmm. women, lots of women um, who have just the same issues. Mm -hmm. And so how I experienced that was um, very comforting, very useful. And also just when you normalise something, it's like, oh, well, this is just what happens. Oh, well, you know, mm -hmm. it really just helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Kind of loses its grip. Yeah, it when does. You can normalize it. it does. Yeah. Yeah. And what was it like to be you know, in a completely different time zone and not be able to make a lot of the live calls. What was that like? So I listened to all the live calls, mm -hmm. um, but at, at a different time. Mm -hmm. So I listened to the recording. Mm -hmm. um, look, that was pos a bit of a pity, but I'm not sure I would have put myself up for live coaching, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so maybe didn't make that much difference mm. you were pretty active in the online community though yeah yeah i was yeah. i was so i i would post models and issues in slack mm -hmm. yeah. and that felt very very helpful to get a bit of argy bargy mm -hmm. over the models and and mm -hmm. um be and also be witnessed and you yeah. know and 
putting just putting the models onto Slack made me really think things through and see mm-hmm. what I was doing. So yeah. that was helpful. Yeah, I I always find it fascinating in the initial coaching program that I did before I decided to become a coach. I never actually got coached live. Uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't make the calls either. They were all during my work hours. And so I would listen to the recordings when I was driving or when I was doing dishes or, you know, whenever I could, but I could never make the live calls and never be coached. And it literally blew my mind at how, you know, six months of that. And I, I wanted to be a coach and I didn't, I had never even gotten coached. That's how much that, that experience changed me. But I think it's about how we listen right? Because you can listen and say, well, you know, her husband didn't die from, you know, brain cancer and, and he was only 32, you know, my, you know, our circumstances are different. So therefore the coaching doesn't apply to me. And, or you can listen and assume that there is something there for you, find what there is of value and Mm. and take it and write and apply it and Mm. how you Mm. listen and the the attitude that you bring, Mm. I think is largely responsible Mm. for what you get out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what did shift for you? What did, what did you get? Well, um, so normalization was huge, but another thing was like, of, of, I'm a long-term mindfulness pra- practitioner, mm-hmm. as you know, so I know that thoughts aren't us, mm-hmm. <laughs> et cetera, et mm-hmm. cetera. But with, um, with mindfulness, you don't directly challenge your thoughts. So, you know, with, in Mum Goes On, you get into the content, which you don't do in mindfulness. You just notice the content. You notice what's happening. You notice the nature of thoughts, etc. But that doesn't mean you don't really, really still believe some of them. And I really, really believed mm. some of my thoughts. And um, one of the, you know, for example, um, I'm going to be alone a lot more. Ipso facto, I'm going to be really lonely. Mm-hmm. And and it's going to get worse. So, which also I think is probably a very common thought that widows have. Yes. And um, <laughs> yes, it is. Mum goes on really drove home to me that uh, you can really challenge your thoughts, mm-hmm. and it's it's worth doing. You can expose them and challenge them. So mindfulness doesn't generally take that. Mm. it's fantastic but it Mm -hmm. doesn't take that um proactive kind of stance Mm -hmm. and so um really having it driven home to me that thoughts are optional that i can challenge Mm -hmm. them etc etc that was that was a big learning i love it how about the decision making like what has shifted in your ability to make decisions the way you think about decisions well, um, up to this point, I've actually felt that I have been making good decisions. So, and I, I'm, Mum goes on reminds me to uh, um, give myself a pat on the back, or at least acknowledge that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. So, I mean, widowhood just—it um, so requires you to step up in so many ways, doesn't it? It's just. Um, I, I say, you know, I've had to woman up over and over again, just over and over again. I have to woman up. There's the next challenge and the next challenge and the next challenge. So, um, yeah, seeing so many other women doing the same thing mm-hmm. and not, and I, I know the this, this stuff about decisions about you can, um, kind of whatever decision you make you can love yourself through it and and you know deal with any feelings that come from it and so on um yeah so that was overall it was helpful yeah Yeah. also just a a a slight reminder there you can also praise yourself for choosing to step up and woman up right like (laughs) because honestly i i think the reason i feel passionately about this is because I see a lot of social media posts from widows and I get a lot of emails from widows more so than, you know, any, any of you would. Right. And a lot of them are filled with women who aren't choosing to engage in their lives and they aren't choosing to, to 
figure out what's next and do the things that you've done, right? And so, yes, it, it's easy to think you have to do it, but a lot of women aren't. And, right. and so it's it's praiseworthy. Right. Like it's it's something right. to praise yourself about for like, <laughs> I am actively engaging in creating the life that I want, right? Like I, yes. I am choosing yes. to do that. And not everybody, yes. not that that makes you better than the people who aren't. No, That's not no, what I'm no. saying. But, but yeah. it's like a missed opportunity to take credit for something that you you really did choose for yourself. Yeah, thank you. And it, I mean, it's still scary. It's still scary. That's right. Yeah, as growth <laughs> always will be. Yeah. What's yeah. what's what's next for you these days? What's what's going on in in your life? So I did I did sell the house. Mum goes on finished, and I'd sold the house the next month. But Boom. during Mum goes on, I was preparing it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and preparing it was absolutely mammoth. That was such a mm. huge task because the detritus of you know, uh, a whole family who are into everything in a house. It was yeah. just a huge task. So yes, so straight after mum goes on, sold the house. And then um, I moved into a rental apartment, which is this one um, in the inner city. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so I was in the outer suburbs and now I'm in a very lively part of the inner city and looking to buy an apartment here. So that's mm -hmm. what's happening now. And also I'm, I'm, more than midway through um i'm still doing some work in in the software company my husband founded and i'm also um midway through an embodiment coaching um mm. course that finishes in august yes do you yeah. do you have ideas of what you want to do with that uh well see this is where the challenges keep coming right like yeah. <laughs> yeah. so um i'm kind of trying to integrate all my learnings, you know, my yoga and my meditation and this embodiment stuff into mm -hmm. an offering. But what exactly that offering looks like, I'm not sure yet. Mm -hmm. I am doing some volunteer coaching already, but mm -hmm. yeah. So do, there's do a, you, there's can you imagine like it's yoga, It the medium is yoga and then the somatics or whatever else is, is brought in? Is that kind of what you're imagining? Well, well, I, I actually, I'm a trained yoga teacher, but I've moved to more mindful movement and, okay. um, and I'm a meditation coach now because I did that qualification. Yep. So um, I'm actually not exactly sure which proportion I'll put things mm -hmm. into this mix. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of um, discovery, I suppose, to happen there into, you well, know, that'll... which, how, how I'll integrate all those things. Yeah. yeah. That'll be one of those things that if you just let yourself, you know, learn by doing, you just try it, test it, see what you love, see what works, see how it resonates and then adjust. Yeah. 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 I mean, how else are you yeah. supposed to know? Right. Yeah, exactly. And all that's a bit scary. But... Oh, totally. Cause you've never done it before. Your primitive brain thinks you could <laughs> yeah, die. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Listen, creating a coaching business was also scary, but, but totally. I'm so happy that I did it. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So good. Yeah. So, so just thinking as we wrap up, like, what is it that you talked about what you would tell yourself in early grief? What is that you, that you want other widows to know that you think would be helpful to them or I mean, words of wisdom? Um, well, um, I think that what I'm reaching for and, and what I sometimes experience is this idea that being a widow is um, tragic, but everybody around us is experiencing their own tragedies. And mm -hmm. like what, what I'm trying to say is that it just um, uh, takes us into our common humanity more deeply. That's, mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to... I'm trying to see widowhood in a way as a bit of a portal, I suppose, to... Mm. Um, to being bigger. Do you, do you see what I'm yeah. getting at? Like, so because, can... yeah, because it's it's just part of the whole human experience and scratch the surface of anyone and they've got yeah. a big loss. And so I just, I'm trying to use it as this crack, I suppose, this yes. opening to something bigger. Yeah, I love that because it and, really is. Yeah, and I've, none yeah. of us get out of, of life without experiencing pain and loss. Yeah, yeah. So um, instead of in, uh, so you asked for widows, what I'd say to widows, 
um, like obviously you don't you're not thinking about that in the early days yeah you know you're just getting through it but um, that's what I would hope for all of us who experience tragedy as we all do that it helps us be bigger um, not to shrink away and so that's what I'm trying to do mm -hmm. I love that. In my own, in my own yeah. scared way. Yeah. No, well, right. I mean, hey, th that's how we do it, right? It's it's just we we feel the fear and, and we do the thing. And yeah. to your point, I, I see I see so much of that. I when I read um Pema Children's When Things Fall Apart, yes. you know, th that was kind of what yeah. what what I it, that was a, actually a book that I could read. Um uh, it was probably a month or so after Hugo died that I read that book. Yeah, and I felt yeah. like it had been written exactly for me. It was just the strangest experience, but I was like, okay, how can I use this? To, how can I let this soften me? How can I let this yes, help yes. me become more in touch with other humans and connect me to them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I love that for you. I love that other people who don't yet know you are someday going to benefit from what you're going to teach them. <laughs> Thank you. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, listen, yeah. is there anything we missed? Anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover? I don't yeah. think so. Okay. Thank you so much for coming on and being willing to share your story and let other people feel hope. A pleasure. And a thank you for offering hope to women in this very common circumstance. Yeah. And that is so um, misunderstood and yeah, underserved. So thank you for being a bit of a beacon of light out there, Krista. It, it is my <laughs> honor and pleasure and it feels so good to me. I love that I get to do it. So I, I receive yeah, that yeah. and also I, I feel so much gratitude that I that I do it. So yeah. All right. Keep in touch. Keep me posted on how your business evolves. Okay. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> thank you. Take Bye. care. Thank you. If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and want to create a future you can truly get excited about even after the loss of your spouse, I invite you to join my Mom Goes On coaching program. It's small group coaching just for widowed moms like you, where I'll help you figure out what's holding you back and give you the tools and support you need so you can move forward with confidence. Please don't settle for a new normal that's less than what you deserve. Go to coachingwithkrista.com and click work with me for details and next steps. I can't wait to meet you.